Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being on here. And I'd like to thank Bob and all the folks with the Southern Region Extension Forestry for helping get this set up. Uh, I'll just give a short, brief introduction of the National Bob White Conservation Initiative before we get into the main meat of the uh, program. The NBCI is a 25-state unified strategy for Bob White restoration and is the first ever unified effort to restore wild Bob White quail to America's landscape. It was created by the state wildlife agencies that compro comprise the core of the Bob White Range and is funded by uh, those agencies, which are 25 states, the Federal Aid and Wildlife Sport and Fish Restoration Program, University of Tennessee, Park Cities Quail, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the Farm Services Agency. NBCI is charged by the states with developing and coordinating the implementation of a national habitat-based approach for the landscape scale restoration of huntable populations of bobwhite quail. These are, this is uh, a list of the sponsors uh, that I just read. And then these are the 25 states that comprise the National Bob White Conservation Initiative and the Bob White, National Bob White Technical Committee. Um, and if you want any more uh, information about NBCI and what we're doing, uh, this, this slide gives our website and my uh, information. <laughs> And I think that uh, that will be sorry that will be posted on the website um, at a later date. And our uh, speaker for today is Ryan Mitchell. He is the outreach and technical assistance coordinator. Robert, I'm going to have to pause for a minute. I got somebody knocking on the door and a dog barking, if that's okay. I'll, I'll jump on, Steve. All right, hi, guys. I'm Ryan Mitchell. I'm the Outreach and Technical Assistance Coordinator for the Longleaf Alliance. Uh, today I'm going to talk about herbicide use for wildlife habitat improvement, uh, mainly in southern forests, uh, specifically about longleaf, um, so those that aren't uh, from the, the longleaf range, uh, I'm glad you're here and I imagine there's a lot that you can take away from this. So I have to throw the disclaimer out there that you uh, need to read the herbicide label every time you use the product. The label lays out approved rates, application methods, storage, handling and disposal, disposal procedures, and environmental safeguards. The label is the law. The Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodicide Act provides for federal regulation of pesticide distribution, sale, and use. Some permissions allowed in this act are to use pesticides at a lower rate than listed on the label, to use a pesticide on a target not listed on the label as long as the site is listed, and apply the pesticide by a method not listed on the label as long as the method is not prohibited on the label. Um, those are some new things that I learned not too long ago and it becomes beneficial when we, with using some of these herbicides. So if you guys, uh, just how we answered the questions earlier, we're going to switch it to a yes or no. Um, let me know if you guys are a certified pesticide applicator in your home state. Looks like we've got a pretty good mix there. All right, so moving on, I bet you guys have heard that landowners' objectives are changing. Rarely do I come across a non-industrial private landowner whose main objective is timber. The U.S. Forest Service conducts the National Woodland Owner Survey. The survey is sent to every landowner who has an FIA plot that falls on their property. 
The Sustaining Family Forest Initiative compiles the data by region and by ownership size. So this graph you see here on the left is a sample of over 2,000 landowners in the southern region who own 50 acres or more. Each landowner is asked to indicate if these 13 reasons for owning woodlands are important or very important to them. They can answer yes, no, or not answer the question. Out of 78% 78, 78 of these landowners in, indicated that legacy was the most important uh, reason for them. Wildlife was 73% and so on down. Only 43% of these landowners indicated that timber was important or very important to them. This is something that needs to be considered when making management recommendations for these landowners that are interested that are more interested in wildlife or aesthetics or restoration than timber. Before getting into specific herbicides, let's talk about habitat needs. Habitat is the area or natural environment in which an organism lives. A habitat is made up of physical factors such as soil, moisture, range of temperature, vegetation, and an availability of light as well as biotic factors such as the availability of food and the presence of predators. The basic requirements are food, water, cover, and space. The key is to, to take a holistic approach to promote healthy ecosystems when managing for wildlife. Ecosystems are constantly changing through succession. We use tools such as thinning, herbicides, and fire to manipulate the forest structure and set back succession. Some wildlife, such as white-tailed deer, are habitat generalists and can survive in a wide variety of habitats. Others, such as Bob White, require very specific habitat needs. Looking at Bob White's, I'm still trying to figure out the buttons on this. Looking at Bob White's, their cover requirements are very specific. They need nesting habitat, brood rearing habitat, loafing cover, escape cover, and roosting habitat. So they become very specific in their needs and they're early successional obligates. Note in the picture on the right how small a bob white chick is after hatching. Looking, diving a little deeper into the habitat needs, nesting habitat has a high bunch grass component with ample amount of bare ground around those. They're ground nesting birds that construct nests using the previous year's dead vegetation. Nesting habitat is the, at least the second growing season after disturbance. The nesting habitat needs to be in close proximity to the brood rearing habitat so the tiny chicks can easily access it. Brood rearing habitat is the first growing season after disturbance and is made up of a weedy annual forb community. Generally, the earlier the successional stage, the greater the plant diversity, and this plant community attracts insects and has an abundance of bare ground that allows the chicks to move easily, see, and catch insects to support their rapid growth. But quail habitat is more than just pine trees and grass. A woody shrub component is important to, uh, to quail as loafing cover and escape cover. It creates a dense overhead canopy, but it's open on the ground that allows them to access it easily and protect them from overhead predators in inclement weather. With the variety of specific habitat needs for quail, there's no one blanket treatment that will get us there. Herbicides are one of the tools that we use to restore native plant communities, which typically enhances wildlife habitat. This is done by reducing the hardwood midstory, which we can increase available, excuse me, available resources for timber, improve fuel conditions by allowing more sunlight to the ground. Herbicides can greatly improve the look of the stand and oftentimes it's our best tool to combat invasive species. We craft a herbicide prescription based on the landowner's objectives the identification of plants that need to be targeted and ones that need to be avoided, current site conditions, and the different soil conditions on the properties. The prescription details the herbicide or herbicides used, the rates to be applied, 
the timing, and the method of application. All of these come together to make up a prescription and hopefully help us achieve our desired results. While I'm talking about this one, you guys can go ahead and uh, indicate if you already have a copy of these resources or not. Um, these resources really do a good job of helping us identify our desired plant species. The Miller and Miller book, Forest Plants of the Southeast and Their Wildlife Uses, is widely available uh, both uh, through Amazon or most uh, big box bookstores. The two on the right are field guides that were created at the Jones Center uh, on the longleaf pine ecosystem. They're laminated pages, phenomenal resource. And those can be acquired by calling the Jones Center uh, and ordering copies of those. They're a good tool to have in the field uh, as well as in your office or in your truck. So moving on to her different herbicides, this out, uh, chart outlines several common herbicides used in longleaf forest management. This chart is for your reference, but by no means is a complete list. Going down through these herbicides, glyphosate is a foliar active herbicide with normal soil activity. It does a good job of eliminating most anything that's green, especially grasses, and can be safely used under pines or hardwoods but it's really not a good standalone brush killer. So this, since it is a foliar active herbicide, it requires good coverage on the target plants. Triclopyr, that's uh, Garlon, is a foliar active herbicide with little to no soil activity. It controls nearly all broadleaf plants, but it doesn't hurt grasses, sedges, or rushes. It is the herbicide of choice when we're targeting uh, waxy species such as yopon, gallberry, wax myrtle, a lot of our flatwoods areas. And it also requires good coverage. Hexazinone is a soil active herbicide that has, a, uh, that has high soil residual activity. It's a phenomenal control for oaks, but it needs rain to activate and the rates applied depend on the soil texture of the site. It's very selective and easy on native grasses and forbs, uh, but this is one that's different because it requires a spring application into early summer. Does not, it is not effective late in the year. A mazapir, um, such as arsenal, uh, chopper, is a foliar and uh, soil active herbicide that goes into the plants through the leaves as well as root uptake and there's significant residual activity. This is probably the best herbicide out there to target sweet gum, but you really need to watch your rate under mature longleaf and do not apply it anywhere near desirable hardwoods. This is one that if you're managing a slash or a, a loblolly stand, oftentimes you can uh, do a mid-story control over the top of it. We'll talk about that a little more later. Sulfamedron is oust. Um, that's a foliar and a soil active herbicide. Usually works best when it's applied as a pre-emergent in the late winter, early spring. You do need um, soil moisture uh, for the pre-emergent to work. It is a water soluble herbicide and it can move on you. So keep that in mind when applying it. Oust is also compounded by pH, um, so if it's a more alkaline site, oust will be a hotter herbicide. So you need to do a soil test on sites before herbicide is applied. So the longleaf ecosystem supports a whole host of legumes, which can be enhanced by some herbicide treatments. For instance, amazapir is easy on legumes. Legumes are very important as uh, food for wildlife, both browse and the seed, and their ability to capture atmospheric nitrogen and return it in the soil. It's one of those things that uh, is usually lacking on sites with uh, sites, longleaf sites with poor soils and uh, frequent prescribed burning. It is unnecessary to do, destroy an intact native understory with an ill-planned herbicide application, especially when 
they're restoring the site um, for long leaf or in the name of wildlife management. We don't have the money or the seeds in production or the knowledge to completely restore an ecosystem uh, to put back everything that we remove. So if you're fortunate enough to work on a site with an intact native ground cover, um, try to use herbicides or rates that are going to keep as many things as possible. This chart is a phenomenal chart uh, that was created by the Forest Productivity Cooperative, but it's very general. So it's, it gives you a good idea, um, but it's not an a end-all, be-all. When looking at this chart, the green signifies low efficacy, and the red means it's highly effective on controlling a particular species. For instance, with hexazinone, it's highly effective on controlling oaks, and for the most part, it's not effective on hitting legumes. Triclopyr or garlon is really good at uh, knocking out uh, a lot of our uh, different, unfortunately it hits legumes, but it knocks out pine and uh, a lot of our hardwoods, but it's real easy on grasses. Amazapyr does a good job on sweet gum and maple, but it doesn't do well on controlling blackberry, uh, pine, or legumes. So this all just comes into play when we're uh, creating a herbicide mix. We use herbicide treatments targeting unwanted vegetation in the mid-story and the, in the understory to increase sunlight to the forest floor and improve the habitat for wildlife. Sometimes you hear these treatments called an FSI, a forest stand improvement, or a TSI, timber stand improvement treatment. This, uh, the FSI or TSI is not, all in, or not inclusive for just uh, herbicide, it is both herbicide and thinning and sometimes mechanical and fire. But we're going to be talking about the herbicide portion here. The herbicide application should all, uh, always be fo followed with prescribed fire at the appropriate time depending on site conditions. I'm going to cover some application methods that we use. Uh, just remember, as I said earlier, if you're treating a lob or slash stand, aerial application for woody control may be an option depending on the herbicide used. In longleaf, for large-scale uh, broadcast applications under a mature canopy, usually we use skidders or tractors, especially when more water is uh, required. When using foliar active herbicides, such as triclopyr, uh, to treat any of our waxes or our hardwoods, the applicator intends to use more water in the mix to ensure a complete coverage. Ground application has less potential for drift and can treat closer to sensitive areas uh, than, they can, than they can by helicopter. Low volume foliar applications, this is also backpack uh, applications. Uh, if you guys can indicate who has uh, calibrated a backpack sprayer to see how much volume you're applying before you go out and spray. Uh, herbicides. So backpack foliar treatments allow the applicator to target specific individual plants with herbicide. It's not a broadcast application. You're able to put the herbicide exactly on what you want it. They require the target vegetation to be less than six to eight feet so the applicator can get good coverage on the target plants and it's not good to spray over your head. So we got a 50-50 on folks that have uh, calibrated backpack sprayers and not uh, those who have not. Um, you can Google uh, the 1 slash 128 method of backpack calibration and there's some really good videos on it uh, online. It's neat to get a couple people together and each go through the exercise to see how much they're putting out because once you start walking across uneven terrain uh, you can put out uh, much more much less herbicide than the prescription uh, calls for. Another method we use uh, with backpacks is basal bark application. Basal bark uses herbicides suspended in an oil car carrier to treat specific stems. And it's typically the thin bark species, usually less than four to six inches. One of the good things about this, it can be applied at any time of the year, even the winter. One of the words of caution, um, if you're using a herbicide like triclopyr garlon for this, 
If the site has too many stems per acre, you can easily exceed the annual maximum rate of herbicide per acre per year. So make sure you follow the label recommendations on that. Hack and squirt and cut stump treatments target specific individuals and are to be avoided during spring sap flow. You can use them uh, most, of the, most of the rest of the year. And one of the benefits with uh, hack and squirt and cut stump is it's not broadcast to herbicide. You're putting herbicide directly on a target species. This publication down here, Herbicide Application Techniques for Woody Plant Control, it's from IFAS, the University of Florida Extension. Is a really good publication that covers uh, basil bark, backpack, uh, hack and squirt, cut stump, and all the chemicals you can use with the rates on it. Um, I think that was included in your uh, the resources for this. So jumping into a couple examples, we're going to go through um, kind of some before and afters. Oh, one more chart before we get to that. This charts for herbicides that are labeled for woody control under mature longleaf stands, and it's included for your records. Um, say milestones on here, we, uh, we use that for pine control and young longleaf stands, also for blackberry control. But this, uh, not at that rate, but milestone has shown really good results for hack and squirt, cut stump, and basal bark applications. Um, so it's an expensive herbicide, but you can use uh, a lot less of it. And Dr. Enlow talks about that in the publication on the previous slide. All right, now jumping into a couple uh, examples. So this example is a Piedmont site in central Alabama. Uh, we're doing longleaf enhancement on it uh, to improve wildlife habitat. In 2016, the stands were thinned, favoring longleaf, removing off-site loblolly and hardwoods. At the time of the thinning, it had been six years without prescribed fire. The site was sprayed by skitter in September 2017 with 64 ounces of Garlon XRT, a non-ionic surfactant, and 20 gallons of water to target the hardwood resprouts. Garlon was selected because mature longleaf are very sensitive uh, to mazapir applications. This is what it looked like a uh, month and a half, six weeks after the herbicide application. You could see since it was a natural stand, the herbicide application was not uniform. There were no rows to follow, but that's all right. Uh, this was done in the name of wildlife, so. Um, it's able to knock back a lot of the woody and release our fuels, which we'll be able to use to target the rest of that woody. The site was burned in January of 2018, and this picture on the right was taken May 22nd, 2018. So you can see uh, September 2017, right before herbicide application on the left, burned. Uh, and then the picture taken May 22nd. We've installed some plots out there to monitor the ground cover response to the forest stand improvement treatments over time. Um, both, we, it was done pre-thinning, so we can really monitor this. But that the difference between the left and the right, you can really see the, uh, how the herbicide application knocked out the, the remaining hardwood mid-story. It's really uh, letting that understory come along. This is a site in central Georgia looking at herbicide rates and ground cover retention. Um, this is for photos are from Nathan Klaus and it's his uh, research. We'll talk more about, his, uh, about it later when we get into the site prep stuff. But this, if you can look at the right, the escort application uh, retained a lot of the grasses and forbs out there. But on the left, the amazapir and glyphosate application uh, targeted a bunch of those guys. And so you can see the difference if you're going in to do, uh, trying to manage for wildlife, this is much more attractive than the amazapir is, uh, amazapir and glyphosate. So it's all about using selective herbicides uh, on specific rates to retain what you want. This is another stand uh, over in uh, Georgia. Looking uh, at uh, uh, native warm season grass release using Garlon XRT. 
It's safe to use under uh, pine and desirable hardwoods. And since garlon is a foliar active herbicide, the applicator really needs to get good coverage over the top of the target species. So the height of the vegetation is important. On stands like this, you can go through and use uh, backpack applications as opposed to the uh, last garlon application stand we saw that needed a broadcast application just due to the amount of hardwood stems per acre. This loblolly stand was treated with a mazapir to target privet and sweet gum. Notice the lack of grass in the ground cover on the right post-treatment. Herbicides can do a lot of things, but uh, other treatments such as thinning and prescribed fire are needed. We can go through and treat it as a stand, uh, remove all the hardwood out of it, but if there's uh, a dense overstory of even desirable pines, uh, it does not allow enough light to get to the ground for that grass community to really come on. This, this also highlights a good practice of treating the midstory while it's suppressed by an overstory. After a thinning operation, the midstory has increased light and resources, allowing it to grow better. And we've been able to get good control of stands by applying hardwood control before we clear cut them. Across the Longleaf Range, uh, this uh, sandhill sites are commonly choked out with scrub oaks in many areas. Upon closer examination of this site, you really get down on your hands and knees and crawl around through the, the turkey oak litter, you could see clumps of wire grass hanging on in what they call the bud bank. So a little clump there, a little bunch there. If we threw a high rate of a here at this site, or we came in, clear cut it, did a, maz did, did a heavy site prep, um, we would end up knocking out all those bunches of grass. And they don't readily recolonize a site. On this side, a fuel wood um, or a biomass chipping operation was conducted to remove the scrub oak. After adequate time for the oaks to re-sprout, the site was treated with hexazinone and burned. They've continued to use fire in this stand, and it's promoted the native ground cover and kept the remaining scrub oaks in the right place. Scrub oaks are a native part or a natural part of our ecosystem on these sandhill sites, and they need to be there but they don't need to be uh, there to the point where that is the overstory tree. It's incident wildlife habitat, and it's made the gopher tortoises happy. So looking at some uh, site prep uh, herbicides, the main goal of a chemical site prep is to reduce competition for trees, specifically hardwoods, to assist with the uh, tree establishment to control any invasive species and improve planter access. Throwing up another chart here uh, of site prep, some very common site prep herbicides. Uh, once again, um, looking down here on escort, um, longleaf is not specifically stated on the escort label for site prep, but it does say without prior experience, it is recommended uh, that other species be planted on a small scale to determine selectivity before large scale plantings occur as unacceptable injury may occur. Bear will not assume responsibility for injury to any conifer species not listed on the label. Um, that is a quote off of the escort label. That with the, um, the information earlier uh, from the FERFA allowing us to use herbicides on a target not listed on the label, as long as the site is listed, um, we were able to use that for site prep and long leaf sites. So these are common rates of the site of the herbicides we use in long leaf site prep. Just because uh, there's a bottom end on this rate does not mean we can't go below it, and oftentimes we do, especially when wildlife habitat is a uh, priority. So this is a longleaf site uh, with reduced competition. Um, there's no competition out there. You have trees and pine straw. Um, all of the benefits that make the longleaf uh, ecosystem unique and diverse are lost due to these heavy site prep rates. 
but it goes with the objectives. This is, site was planted, uh, and the objective for this site was to become a pine straw raking site, which is okay. And the heavy site prep rate's all right for that. Um, but if it, for ground cover retention, for wildlife habitat, it's probably not the way you want to go. Sometimes it's necessary to use high rates uh, of herbicide during site prep. If we have an a area of improved forages, a Bermuda, Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, fescue, uh, we need to treat those early on. By treating those early on, we're able to use the rates we need without injuring any trees present. Once the trees get in the ground, our hands get tied with what herbicides we can use and when we can use them. This stand uh, down here in the bottom picture is an eight-year-old longleaf stand. Um, landowners trying to get control of the Bermuda grass by spraying a 5% glyphosate solution. And over multiple treatments a year for many years, he might be able to do it. Uh, but it's very labor intensive and costly. Uh, I'm putting a plug down here for Tall Timbers Research Station. Did some good research a couple years ago on forage control and upland pine systems. You can uh, pop it into your Google search engine and easily find it. But they found that uh, Seth Oxidem did a real good job of knocking out improved forages while retaining some of the native bunch grasses that might be present, as well as some of the forbs and legumes that were present. Um, so that's one to ch check out if you're ha having to run into the situation, which is very common. Controlling or let me rephrase that, attempting con to control invasive species should be started before site prep. Um, I, I live in the land of uh, Kogon grass. Um, it was introduced to the United States just up the road from me uh, over 100 years ago. This is a common site. Uh, this stand is a 40-acre loblolly stand um, that has a 100% uh, grass understory of Kogon grass. Um, still burned every other year and very tight canopies on these loblolly. Um, but one of the benefits to having the loblolly overstory is it can take high rates of amazapir and you could go in and treat that site now with amazapir and try to start removing those invasives before you go through the clear cut. On the right uh, is a 500 acre stand of slash pine down in the panhandle of Florida. Just went through its second thinning. Uh, beautiful herbaceous understory that now that's completely inundated with uh, Japanese climbing fern. These Japanese climbing fern and kogon grass need to be uh, controlled before young pines of any species are planted. Uh, this is a picture of Japanese climbing fern under kogon grass thatch. Uh, glyphosate and amazapir, what we use to treat kogon. Glyphosate or metsulfuron methyl which is escort, or is what we use to treat climbing fern, um, they must be done before the trees are present. And if you have a bad problem with climbing fern, uh, best of luck in, in removing it. Another way to think about it when we're creating a site prep prescription is to protect the blank. And you can insert here fuels, nesting cover, brood rearing cover, food, habitat, by retaining uh, this intact ground cover, we retain all of those. It can be done even when using a mazapir. Rates matter, though. If uh, the herbaceous or real grassy understory is important to you, try to keep the amazapir, the four pound product, under 16 ounces per acre. Um, you can use it on more of a woody release, target a lot of those hardwood species, but retain your fuels to where you can clean it up with fire. So uh, some of the, Nathan, Gla Nathan Klaus with Georgia DNR absolutely says it best. When looking to restore a longleaf site, a good site prep will help us get longleaf established by controlling the hardwood competition. This can be done while conserving the diverse ground cover that makes the longleaf ecosystem unique. By ma maintaining the ground cover, we maintain wildlife habitat and the ability to burn at year one or year two. That's really important when we're dealing with a lot of the uh, lot of the hardwoods or off-site pine that try to come into those stands when we use uh, an alternate site prep. 
But when you're thinking about restoration or wildlife habitat, a, bi a bad site prep may prevent prescribed fire, and it usually does pre prevent prescribed fire for the first three to five years. It encourages the weedy species and reduces or eliminates a lot of what makes the longleaf habitat great. I work from Virginia to Texas uh, on longleaf restoration, and this is a, a very common site prep prescription that I run across, and it's done countless times over the phone all across the longleaf range. It's not wrong for establish, establishing or growing trees, but the, there are other ways to do it when wildlife habitat or restoration is a priority. They'll go in and throw high rate high rates of arsenal at the site to clean up any hardwoods. Well, there might be a waxy or two, so they throw a high rate of garlon or a rate of garlon out there. If there's any off-site pine or just to show brown down, show some burn down, six quarts of glyphosate are usually tossed in, and that's going to burn up anything that's out there. And 32 to 96 ounces of surfactant. And 10 gallons of water if by helicopter, maybe 20 gallons if you're doing it by ground. Sometimes oust is tossed in there uh, to add to some, add for uh, pre-emergent control next spring, um, but I don't know how well that works, looking at some of the research. This is what you end up with on some of those sites, especially some sites with deep sands. Now, this is in North Carolina, three-year-old longleaf stand with a heavy site prep. At first look, you look out there and there's trees and sand and a little bit of woody debris. There are no fine fuels. There are no grass out there. Um, you can see a bunch or two here or there. It's just not there. But upon closer examination, the stand is completely uh, covered with brown spot needle blight. Uh, that's a fungus that gets onto the longleaf trees and it's easily controlled with fire. But if you don't have the fuels out there to burn, um, you have a mess on your hands uh, when it comes to treating these stands. Another problem arises when the stand is inundated with off-site pine seedlings and you have no fuel to carry the fire. Um, this is a stand that had you could see where fire burned just torch fuel pretty much, turned the little loblolly brown, but every bit of that green is loblolly too. That just was not uh, controlled. It does not take long on a site with good soil moisture for loblolly to outcompete the longleaf. An early application of milestone, in the case on the left, or on the right, a pre commercial thin or carrying it to the first thinning are the only real options. This is stand on the right, it's a five-year-old longleaf stand, and you can see longleaf out here, but you also see the loblolly. There's the longleaf, loblolly. All right, question. Has anyone had an issue with a mazapir damage on newly planted longleaf seedlings? Or e any pine seedlings in the south? So I, I had I ran into this last year. Uh, waited uh, site was a, a sprayed in, or two years ago. Excuse me. Site was sprayed in uh, September and was planted mid February. But we ran into a drought for a little while and it ended up uh, injuring a lot of the trees. Didn't kill them, but it happened. Uh, Dr. Dickens, Dr. Minogue, and Dr. Moorhead have a paper that's in user resources addressing the appropriate rates of amazapir and the timing of plant uh, spraying and planting to avoid residual herbicide damage in the, uh, from residual herbicide damage. A good rule to follow is to wait at least 60 days when applying 24 or more ounces of 4 pound amazapir or 48 plus ounces of 2 pound amazapir. This is with normal rainfall. If you look at the paper, there's several charts on the paper. This chart specifically for the four pound formulation. There's one on the two pound formulation. So let's say 24 ounces of amazapir was applied on my site uh, in September. So we go up here to September. 
and it was a sandy site in Alabama. We recommend planting your new seedlings in November as soon as you start getting fall rains again so it can take uh, advantage of that soil moisture and put on growth. Preferably you have them in the ground before the end of the year. So looking at the chart, you follow September down, the bottom sections, long leaf and flash, 24 ounces. I can't plant in November, can't plant in December, January, so I'm at February, March, but with a 24 ounce application. Oh, but wait a minute. It's a sandy site. So you look down here, if it's a sandy site, well drained, low organic material, application and planting may be increased by one month. So you're saying kick it out to April to plant behind a 24 ounce Arsenal AC application while well, the planters have moved on at that time. So it's one of those things to just to be aware of um, timing of application and amount of herbicide really come into play. So many of you guys, especially uh, from Georgia, Alabama, Florida, have seen this uh, publication. Uh, is your site prep hurting or helping or hurting your longleaf pine restoration? You can easily find it through uh, Google search. But Nathan Klaus did some research on different site prep formulations and the ground cover response to each. Change in the woody and herbaceous cover. You look at uh, the site prep is down here on the bottom what was treated. You look at the Amazapir, 48 ounce of this is uh, chopper, the two pound product. It increased woody over control. And here the woody is the, he signified that is the blackberry. Um, blackberry is a good soft mass producer, but if it's the only thing out there, it's going to uh, create a canopy over any fine fuels, any grasses we have, and blackberry just doesn't burn. Same thing with the amazapir and the glyphosate application, blackberry increased over the control. Everything else uh, decreased the woody. So looking at the other side, the herbaceous vegetation, increase in herbaceous. And if we're managing for quail um, or any of these other, uh, other wildlife species, that early successional habitat is important. So we want a good herbaceous understory. The metsulfuron, which is escort, and the ULW, which is no longer available, but that's a hexazinone product, increased the amount of herbaceous cover on those plots. What about the changes in grass uh, associated with the sites? Amazapir, amazapir and glyphosate, all less than the control. But you look over here, escort, hexazinone, triclopyr, which is our garlon, and a ULW, another hexazinone treatment. All these uh, treated the sites, um, all those sites had an increase in grass cover. Um, that's a great thing. That gives us fuel, but it also gives us habitat. What about weedy cover? And this isn't necessarily that good herbaceous weeds that we use for brood habitat. This weedy cover is weeds such as dog fennel, uh, mare's tail, um, rattle box, stuff that doesn't provide much value. These uh, weedy increased with the mazapir and the mazapir glyphosate application, but everything else these de decreased. So it was is pretty uh, eye opening the difference between these. So putting this all together, he came up with what he's calling a preferred site prep treatment of 48 ounces of Garlon XRT, two ounces of Escort, a non ionic surfactant. What does this look like on the ground? So this is one of his test sites 19 months after treatment. You look in the front, good herbaceous ground cover. Look in the back, beyond that tree line, that's the Amazapir site prep back there. Um, there's not much herbaceous cover growing back there. I bet you can guess where the quail and the Bachman, Bachman sparrows were. Um, they were all up here. So after 19 months, they had 93% longleaf survival on this site. That's pretty impressive. Uh, a note on this herbicide uh, prescription is this was tested on a Piedmont site. So it was not tested on the southern rough. Uh, our yopons, um, some of our more difficult to control species, this was not tested on. What he did not get good control on were the scrub oaks, turkey oak, blue jack oak, 
but he treated those in the spring with pronone, uh, which is a hexazinone product. But working with an industrial private landowner in Texas, um, and Texas, for those who have, have not been to the Piney Woods of East Texas, it is uh, the Yopon uh, holdout, the, the phenomenal Yopon growth over there. We were able to test this mix. This site was treated with 48 ounces of Garlon XRT, 2 ounces of Escort, a non-ionic surfactant, and 30 gallons of water applied by Skitter. When we're applying uh, Garlon, especially on Yopon, using that much water is a great thing. It really helps coverage. If you look in these pictures, it did not eliminate all the Yopon. There were still uh, several bunches of it across this stand. But this was 11 months. This picture is 11 months after um, application of the herbicide and a site prep burn. That is a phenomenal understory response. We had quail out there, tons of bunch grasses, and your little longleaf are doing just fine out there. Um, for the first birthday present for these longleaf, uh, they're going to get uh, a prescribed burn at year one. So another site where we tested it, uh, south of I-10 in Baldwin County, Alabama, uh, 20 miles from the Gulf Coast. Went out there as Yopon and uh, a scrub live oak that was about four and a half feet tall. This is a non, excuse me, that last of the Texas site was an industrial private landowner where timber does matter. This site is a uh, non-industrial private landowner who's managing for wildlife, including gopher tortoises on the site. Site was treated July 13th with 60, 64 ounces of Garlon XRT, two ounces of metsulfuron methyl, one quart of methylated seed oil, a different surfactant, in 25 gallons of water per acre. Came back and looked at the site here on the right 18 days after treatment and um, got really fast burn down, which is not necessarily what you want with the Garlon application. Um, we made the mistake of using the wrong surfactant, switched back to a non-ionic surfactant uh, for all the other sites we treated. So looking May 3rd this year, 10 months after treatment, we did not get good control of the oak. We knocked it way down, but we did get really good yopon control. Look underneath that yopon, over the, the little canopy of yopon, and bunch grasses everywhere. Released a ton of uh, flowering forbs and legumes. It also uh, released the wire grass that was in the understory. Um, so we were extremely pleased with how that worked out. So I threw this chart in here too to, um, for herbaceous weed control. We don't have a lot of time to get into this on Young Stands of Longleaf today. Uh, Bugwood.org um, has a phenomenal publication about herbaceous weed control uh, in Longleaf, Loblolly, and Slash. But I want to urge you caution with this, uh, this application right here. The Arsenal AC over the top of Young Longleaf, ages 2 to age 5. Uh, it is on label. And it says it's uh, acceptable to apply this after August 15th. Um, I've seen too, too many stands that were injured or destroyed with this application trying to get a, a handle on some hardwood. Um, so I, I do not recommend using that. But it's one of the things that uh, a lot of those stands can be cleaned up with fire. So trying to summarize what we kind of talked about today, uh, there's no silver bullet. Um, all the herbicides have pros and cons. Each one of them uh, has, uh, uh, can target good things, but they do also knock out good things. Determine the landowner's objectives and create a prescription to help achieve it while minimizing collateral damage. You do not have to apply maximum rates. And with herbicides, a little is good and more is not necessarily better. Follow herbicide uh, applications with prescribed fire. And finally, when it comes to herbaceous weed control, do you need it? Sometimes, yes, especially on uh, old ag or pasture sites. Other times, fire will get the job done uh, with much less injury to the trees. All right, and this picture right here is a post-oak 
savanna with scattered longleaf. Uh, it's kind of the reverse of what we see in the longleaf savannas with scattered post oaks. Uh, beautiful site. All right, thank you, Ryan, for uh, the presentation. It was excellent. Folks, if you got questions, now is the time to type them into the chat window. I've seen a couple people have done that while Ryan was uh, presenting. So we'll start with those questions. Ryan, the first one is, are forest managers seriously considering possible use of the wild forest fire brigade, horses eat brush and grass, which would require zero pesticides and has been effectively used to lessen wildfire fuels in the West? I am sorry, I cannot answer that. I do not know anything about the Wild Horse Fire Brigade, but I'm going to check it out now. So, sorry about that. And here's a comment uh, from Robert Franklin. It's a comment that says, a lot of folks here are using oust extra or escort in the longleaf site prep tank mixes. That, that is correct. And thanks for that comment, Bobby. Um, oust and oust uh, extra, which has the escort in it, which you've got to be careful of. Sometimes it's used in uh, herbace herbaceous weed control by mistake um, and will cause damage. They're often added to site prep mixes for carryover weed control. I'm talking with Dr. Pat Minogue about it. He just does not have the research to uh, to support the the uh, putting all that in for herbaceous weed control and getting good control in the spring, getting that carryover control. So um, it's something that's often tossed in. Okay, the next question is from Kyle Steele. He's wondering if goats are utilized in the south for woody understory control. Kyle, they are. Um, we have a, a, a park in Birmingham, Alabama that has a team of, I think they call them eco goats, uh, and they're moving them around uh, the, the state park for uh, privet control, controlling on some of our invasives. So we have a, a, some landowners that are using goats as well as piney woods cattle um, to uh, get control of some woody understory. Anything they can reach, they'll eat. Okay, the next, uh, there from Rob Gano, uh, I was wondering if you could show the screen listing the species controlled or not controlled by each herbicide. So if you want to back up to that. Oh, yeah, I will. Uh, there you go. And just so you know, Rob, the these slides, and I'm posting the, uh, are available online as a PDF file. I'll get you the URL. I mistakenly just paste the title and not the actual link. Let me do that in the chat window. Um, but it is on the website where you joined the webinar today. You can actually download that, uh, the presentation slides. So you'll be able to see that table there. Um, hey, Bob, yes. uh, Sandra, if you could shoot me an email, my email is on the last slide, uh, ryan at longleafalliance.org, with any information about the Horse Brigade. Uh, I, I'm curious about it, so I appreciate it. And why don't we uh, move to the last slide again? And that way, if anybody needs your contact information, they can get it. Uh, here's a question from James Davis. Oh, sorry, we'll get to James in a second. Let me back up a second. Joanne Shows wants to know how educated do private landowners need to be on herbicides or how do you verify your foresters using the right mixes? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of having our landowners uh, educated on anything that's going on, uh, herbicide use, prescribed fire. Um, they don't necessarily need to be up to uh, a commercial level of knowledge, but a good working knowledge of it helps. Um, how do they verify their foresters using the right mixes? Um, some key words that I've, I've found when, when, when you tell a, land, or a landowner says, I want to see it work quick, I want to make sure it's, everything's brown, um, I, I, when, when they start going through words like that, they're going to throw 
all the herbicide in there to make sure that it's brown and it's dead and it, it shows results that way. Um, just being on the same page with your uh, consulting forester, um, for them to know what your objectives are and that you're okay, we call it having a site look a little dirty. Um, there might be some hardwood left out there, stems of it, but if we have grass out there, I can take care of it with fire. Um, so as long as they you are on the same page about objectives, um, that that's a, uh, that is a big plus. Okay, the next question is from uh, James Davis, and he's wondering if you have a recommendation for effective herbicides for Cherokee rose. We have used. It depends where where it's located. Um, if you pull up uh, the Southeastern Guide to Invasive Species and Their Control. Uh, it's a book put out by a publication, only available PDF now through the U.S. Forest Service. That will have the application methods in there. Um, I don't want to tell you wrong depending on what your site is. I've only controlled it in pasture sites where I haven't had an overstory that I needed to worry about. Okay. Uh, do you, for James Saucer, I was wondering if you have any suggestions for site prep with sweet gum, Saracia, Theresa. Uh, Teresa, thank you, and Stiltgrass. James, I'm going to reply to <laughs> your email. <laughs> um, I've got the email for this in here, uh, but Sweet Gum will probably, Garlon XRT will take care of the Teresa uh, and does a good job of controlling Sweet Gum. Uh, the Stiltgrass, uh, uh, Mazapir, I'm going to have to look into that one a little more um, to see if we can avoid, it's knowing what your site is, seeing if we can avoid doing a, a a broad spectrum her, uh, herbicide like a glyphosate. So I will get. I had to get through this webinar before I could get to your email, but I'll get to it. I promise. So, folks, uh, I'm going to push out the URL uh, for the continuing education credits, as well as the uh, Survey Monkey post survey to uh, let us know how things went with today's webinar and everything. So. This will launch a window of your browser on your computer. It might pop up behind the uh, Blackboard Collaborate or if you have multiple monitors or something like that on another screen. Give it a minute. There's over 100 of us on today's webinar. And uh, it will take a minute for it to load and stuff. If you run into trouble here in a couple minutes, uh, you can reach out to me by uh, the chat window and I'll follow up with you on that. So, and then Steve Chapman has a comment, well, a couple other comments. One, Robert Franklin uh, commented that many foresters deferred herbicide recommendations to the applicator. Uh, so it's probably a good thing if you are a landowner uh, to talk with your forester and see if that's what he does. And if so, make sure the applicator is on the same page as you and your forester when it comes to what you're trying to accomplish on your property. Um, and then Steve Chapman, uh, remember for Bob White management, you will want one third grasses, one third shrubs, and one third forbs and legumes. The grasses are for nesting, shrubs for escape cover, and forbs and legumes for food. And we uh, thanks for those comments, folks. Any last minute questions for our speaker today? Okay, with that, I'd like to thank uh, Ryan. Thank you for taking the time to do this, and Steve for helping to pull it together. Do appreciate it. Ryan, you did a great job. It was very informative. Thank you very much. Y'all have a wonderful day.